Thanks for tuning in guys, it's the Pest and Lawn Ginger, and today we're going to talk about grub control, identification, repair, and prevention. Now it's getting to be that time of the year where grubs become a hot topic. You go out, you look at your lawn, you see a few less desirable areas, fish in a barrel. I got grubs, right? Well that's usually how it works, especially when I'm trolling a lot of these forums. People just like to look at a lawn and say, I got grubs, so I'm gonna take you through my process. Now the ginger wants you out there slaying your lawn, but we also don't wanna be applying materials that are unnecessary. So I'm gonna bring you through my four step process. Step number one is pattern identification. When it comes to patterns, we're commonly dealing with two different types of patterns. One is a uniform problem, or a problem that's occurring across an entire surface area, or we're dealing with a random area that's just a spot in the lawn that needs to be checked out. Now, when it comes to grubs, we're generally dealing with a random pattern, and the shape itself is commonly kind of jagged and has no rhyme or reason to it. Now, take this lawn for example. I would classify this as a uniform pattern. It's got a slight brown haze, across the entire surface. You don't see a lot of variation in jagged lines, colors. It's pretty uniform across the entire area. Random patterns can come in all different shapes and sizes, but the suspicious ones look very similar to this, where we have a nice even surface across the plane until we get to a random spot in the lawn, just like this. And when we're dealing with different types of shapes and patterns. This one actually has kind of a cheetah print to it that I commonly associate to either bugs or lack of water. If you've isolated a random pattern, you may have grubs, but you also may not have grubs. Time to get to step number two, which is the pull test. The pull test is an effective test to see if the grass is still intact with the soil. The easiest way to do it is to take your hand like a bear claw. We don't want any crabby pinchers out there because anybody can rip out the grass. But we're gonna take a big handful of grass and we're just going to tug on the grass. The point of this is, is just to see if it's organically in the lawn. I know a lot of you guys out there are CrossFitters and we don't necessarily need to try to just yank the grass out. Trust me, if you have grubs, it's gonna come out really easy. Let's talk about a couple different scenarios. Let's say you got your bear claw in there, you tug on the grass and it stays strong. But you're like, Ginger, there's still a problem with the lawn, so now what's my next step? Typically, you're gonna go after sprinkler coverage and repairing the grass. It usually comes down to drought stress dormancy. We'll get to the repairs in just a little bit. Now, if you do take your bear claw, you pull on the grass, you get a handful of grass. I want you to look at the grass and I want you to examine if the roots are intact. If you're looking down and you're seeing bare soil, chances are you've had a grub infestation. But if you're looking at the grass, you look at the soil and the roots are still intact in the soil and you tug on the roots, chances are you're dealing with some sort of a sod webworm or cutworm. Sod webworms and cutworms can be extremely small in size when they're young. So it's very important that you part the grass and give it a good look. Inspection is key. If you cannot find evidence of bugs, you probably don't have bugs and may just have drought stress dormancy or some other underlying issue. If you pull on the grass and it comes up like sheets of carpet, it feels scary. Now, the one thing I want you to pay attention to here is you will find the grubs. Make no mistake of it. Now, the one thing I want you to understand is if you're not finding bugs, you may have another problem or multiple issues. But if you have grubs, you're definitely going to be finding grubs. Whether you have grubs or not, doing a random pull test every mow or every other mow between the months of May and August can save you a lot of heartache because if you find the grubs early on, you can minimize the amount of damages. Now there's always a stubborn one in the bunch. So for those of you that are stubborn, you go around the damaged areas and the best thing to do is to pull a massive core sample. Now I just do this by grabbing a shovel and I cut four sides out of it. Now what this is going to do is we're going to dig down about six to eight inches and really look at the plug. Now when you pull a plug this big, the damages are going to be minimized because we're going to be pulling the core 
taking a good visual at it. And the fun thing is, is you can see the root zone, you can see the crown, you can see the thatch layer and the active grass, but you can also put it back and it will look just as good as new. This type of test is extremely beneficial for those of you who have Japanese beetles that have a problem with them overwintering. And if you're gonna be checking for grub problems late in the season, this is going to be the best test. Now that we've properly identified if you have a grub problem or a sod webworm problem, we can move on to step number three, which is the repair. Now the repair comes twofold. We need to focus on getting rid of the active bugs, but we also need to focus on repairing the grass. Now, luckily for you at home, I'm gonna make this process simple, and I'm going to put the recommended products in the description of the video, whether they're preventive measurements or if they're curative measurements. That way you don't have to waste a lot of time. Now, the good news is whether you have sod webworms, cutworms, or grubs, the best thing to do is to use a curative insecticide. Now for residential, I find the easiest way to put down a curative grub control measure is through a granular. Now my preferred choice for fast acting grub killing is the BioAdvance Grub Killer Plus. The only downside of this product is it is just a curative measure, it does not have any preventive measures. And that brings us to the BioAdvance Complete Insect Killer, which is a two-way formulation. Although it doesn't kill the grubs as fast, it will give you both preventive measures and curative measures. Now, for those of you who want to take a more professional approach, BioAdvance makes a grub killer in a liquid and you're more than welcome to spray it on. This will save you a little bit of money. It's fast acting and works well. Now, for you commercial guys, I recommend a combination of Cyanara and Imidacloprid 2F. The Cyanara is your curative. The Imidacloprid 2F is your preventive that grows through the plants. So as the grubs start to feed on the roots, it minimizes damage and will also give you a 9 to 12 week resistance. Whether you're spraying and slaying or if you're broadcasting with granular, it's important to do the entire lawn when you're finding evidence of bugs. Now let's switch gears and talk about repairing the lawn. Now that could be easier said than done. No matter if you had drought damage, if you had sod webworms or grubs, it may be time for a biostimulant. Now my favorite biostimulant for repair and recovery is Essential 101. Now I know a lot of you guys out there are sold on the next products, the RGS is another good step. Now the Essential 101 has L amino acids, C kelp and humic acid to repair in the recovery process. Now I've seen Essentials Plus 101 take a lawn from zero to hero in no time, but you do have to force a little bit of growth when areas are damaged and when the temperatures are hotter. So we wanna look at a good fertilizer. Now, if you ended up just having clip damage, I recommend higher in nitrogen, and that would be the 1704 by ProPete, and all this will be in the description of the video. Now, if you ended up with grub damage, we're gonna want a little bit more phosphorus and a little bit more potassium to aid in the recovery process, especially when it's warm, and to force some growth. And that's where the ProPeat 1358 comes in really handy, is it has that extra phosphorus to shoot the roots again or to force rooting growth. And it's got potassium for overall health. If we go back and look at the shapes and the colors, it's gonna start off by almost looking like a fluorescent color because it's in stress. Now this homeowner got extremely impatient and started ripping out all the grass. Please don't do this unless the grass is 100% dead. Often enough, we put that 13.58 down, we force a little bit of growth, and we can get a lot of this back. However, if it is 100% dead, since the grubs do eat all the root bases, and if you don't force growth soon enough, you're going to have to resod these areas. Now that we have a good foundation for identification and repair, we move on to the final step, which is prevention. Now as an overall rule of thumb, your preventive measurements are 
commonly going to go down between the months of May, June, and July, depending on how hot it gets in your area and the type of grub that you get. When it comes to preventive measurements, imidacloprid, like Merit, is the best systemic insecticide that you can get to grow through the plant. Whether or not you're dealing with bill bug grub control or Japanese beetle grub control, timing is everything, and understanding which of the two you have is also very important. Now, my local area of Utah, we deal a lot with the billbug grubs. Now you see by this chart, if you look at the month of May, that's when the billbug is going to be laying the eggs that eventually turns into larva. Now the best preventive measurement that we can do is put down our imidacloprids in May, so that way they travel systemically through the plant. So when the larva starts feeding in the beginning to mid to end of June and July, it kills them as a preventive measure. Now adult billbug grubs tend to overwinter in the adult stage in the lawn debris. So this should give you an extra incentive to get those sun joes out to remove the debris in the fall. Japanese beetles are a completely different beast than the bill bugs. You'll notice that they actually overwinter in the larval stage. The best time to treat them would be July as they lay their eggs. You can get those imidacloprids back into the ground in anticipation for their first feeding in August and September. Now, some of these dates for the preventive measures may defer, and I would suggest that you call your local extensions to the agricultural department for recommended dates. Japanese beetles aren't picky and the best preventive measure that you can is to get rid of as many Japanese beetles as possible before they lay those eggs. Now the ginger preferred product for this is Sayonara. It's got a quick heavy knockdown to it so it penetrates those thick exoskeletons of the Japanese beetle. Japanese beetles are not picky eaters. They feed on over 300 species of plants devouring leaves, flowers, and overripe or wounded fruit. They're also like a lot of my tan friends out there, they like to be in the sun. So check those southwest corners of the houses where it stays really nice and warm. They'll typically eat in pockets and they usually work together devouring everything in sight. Now, as a friendly reminder, it's important to read the labels of these insecticides. Some of them are not rated for fruit-bearing plants, so if you plan on spraying fruit-bearing plants, check out the TenGuard SFR label or Carbaryl. Now, for those of you who have had a history of problems, we're going to want to look into something a little bit more organic and long-term, and that's where products like Milky Spore come into effect. Now, Milky Spore is nice because it puts a spore in the soil so that way when you have grubs the spore affects the grubs and the more the spore affects the grubs the more it passes along to the surrounding grubs that are going through the soil well. now when it comes to milky spore it's a fantastic remedy for both curative and preventive measures if you understand how to use it now in the first two years of using milky spore you need to do up to three applications now it works best if there are dense populations of grubs as a spore passes through each grub it's contagious and the more contagious it becomes the more it sets in the soil and the more curative and preventive measures that you get so again you do have to apply it two to three times a year but this may be a wonderful option if you're into organics and especially if you've had a history of having grubs in the lawn and you have japanese beetles just keep in mind if you don't have a large grub population this is not going to be an effective measure because it takes the grubs to spread the spore. Now, shout out to my international crowd. I didn't forget about you guys either that end up with grub problems that don't have access to the same products that we do. The best thing that you can get is a beneficial nematode. Now, nematodes are a little freaky dicky. They are organic, they're roundworms, but they enter through the mouth and the naughty no-no touchy place of the grubs and they end up basically acting almost like a parasite and killing them within. It works fantastic, but you need to make sure that you get the right beneficial nematodes. So I'm gonna put a link in the description below. Now for a lot of you guys out there who are looking for organic solutions, you can reapply these beneficial nematodes without consequence. So make sure that you buy sufficient for your needs. Now's that wonderful time to get off the couch and go slay that lawn. Now just remember, identification is key, doing the right repair, but the prevention is the money maker to be in the Joneses, guys. If you guys have any questions or concerns, hit me up in the comments. You know I'd love to help you guys out. Till next time, this is the Pest and Lawn Ginger. We're out.
Mr. Rolls Royce. Hey man, how'd you like today's video? How'd it go? Hmm, still not impressed. Got it.